not quite one fourth and never just half, but the entirety of one primate, whole. It is the part of a story, an idea that means more to you than me. Hello and welcome to Full Gorilla Life. We are Jeremy Keen, Larry Medina, and Corey Hewlings. Each week, we will break down an important life concept or talk with an inspiring person so that you can live your full gorilla life. Welcome back. Today we're with uh, Gina or Regina Hunter. Uh, we're going to get into a discussion with her about uh, how she's handled and dealt with an um, almost unthinkable tragedy. Um, before we get into that, uh, Jeremy's going to go through some Gorilla Gauntlet questions with her. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having glad, me. Definitely glad to have you. All right. So these are some quick rapid fire. They're not always rapid fire. We People jump in, but we'll try to make it that way. The Gorilla Gauntlet. Number one, married or single? Married. iPhone or Android? iPhone. You always been an iPhone? No, I well, I mean, I had an Android a few years ago, but it was like LG, top, low, low, low bottom of the barrel kind of. Uh-huh. Were you iPhone before that? No, no. So iPhone, no. Just uh, in the last like three years, I think I've had an iPhone. Okay. Are you ever going back? No. I just find it interesting. I have a cloud now. Yeah. Once that's you're that's exactly what he says a lot. Yeah, yeah. Once you're there, once you're hooked. You, like, yeah. you can't go back. My husband's got like an iMac and it's, yeah. all, it's all connected. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's a good. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite movie or book or both? Okay. Uh, I'm a big, big book person. So right now it would be uh, The Night Circus and movie would probably be When Harry Met Sally. Oh. No one's classic. Kidding. What is The Night Circus? I can't remember the the author, which is terrible. I've read it a couple times over the last few years. It's a really just a lovely story about magicians and a night circus. And okay. I, so it's, it's not like metaphoric me. or anything. It's kind of really about. No, like, I mean, it's it's written in prose pretty much. It's just so eloquent and lovely and like mystic. I just, Interesting. Cool. Really I'll have to tell my wife about that one. See, she might be interested. Your wife will like it. I'm a nonfiction guy. I, oh. if, if I'm not learning from it, I'm probably not going to read it. I've been really into nonfiction. I just read um, The Only Plane in the Sky, which was the oral history of 9 11. Before mm-hmm. that, I did the Steve Jobs and the Bad Blood. And, okay. And oh, and um, The Run of His Life. The I think you've already one. outdone my whole book reading. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Yes. <laughs> I'm love, just teasing. I love a book. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. And I used to only be fiction. How was The Only Plane in the Sky? It's, it's it's you have to read it in parts it's very because it's all the only people that i mean it's this guy writing it but he's taking everybody's words from that day and it only really deals with that 24 hours on 9 11 and so it's it's yeah. that seems kind of heavy it's too. heavy yeah definitely I'm a heavy gal. i'm gonna have to check that out i don't like fic- that's non-fiction so i can yeah. read it i'm allowed <laughs> <laughs> favor uh beer whiskey or wine wine okay red or white um, right now, I'm very into rosé, but okay. my white would be like a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. So so wine in a book is probably like your jam oh then? Oh, my God, if I could. <laughs> I'd be um, favorite genre of music? Probably just pop. And, you know, I have a record player, and I love uh, Sinatra at the Sands. That's like my oh. favorite record to play. Yeah. Other than that, I'd be like, oh, Taylor Swift. Larry's going to hear that and be disappointed because he has a record player. He just yeah. got into some vinyl. I got one on my Christmas list. Oh. I, like, I really this, it does have a great sound. It really oh, does. It's, it's just, I love to go into like a thrift store and just, I have like the Carpenters, like their greatest hits and yeah. have his greatest hits and Saturday Night Fever and just really ridiculous old records along with like my Frank Sinatra and... Yeah, I now I could listen to Frank Sinatra probably almost every night. My like, mom yeah? every Sunday Sinatra, yeah. Sinatra, or was it Sid Mark and Sinatra, and Sunday mornings that's how you woke up. And so that's just, a great that's a great thing to wake up to. Oh, that's like Sinatra awesome Sundays. That and the like, smell of like bacon. And a, <laughs> you just gave Corey a, <laughs> <laughs> a new thing now. It's yeah. perfect. It's yeah. a perfect Sunday with something cooking in the yeah. kitchen. Oh, oh man, bacon and eggs, Sinatra, and the smell of newspaper and matches. That's actually. Sounds very that sounds like a title of a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what do you drive? I drive an old, uh, it's like a 2006 Ford Focus. All right, on it's a mom car, but my son called it Kesha, so she knows how to party. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, this one's got a little bit of a 
split on our end, but reservations or just walk in? I mean, if it's a big party, reservations. Thank you. If it's just like, you know, Tuesday night, I'm going to walk in. Exactly. I think it depends on the place. If I'm really like getting dressed up and everything, I'm not going to wait. I'll, I'll call ahead. Right get the reservation. Yeah, isn't it annoying when you do make a reservation, you get dressed up, and then you go and you wait for an hour? When I made a reservation, I'm not waiting. I, I've done <laughs> this, though. like, And I know it's been on like busy nights, like Valentine's Day and stuff like that, but that annoys me. I would leave. I'm not waiting anywhere for an hour. Yeah. Like, I usually have really uncomfortable shoes on, so. I just waited. I just waited an hour <laughs> for Miami subs this weekend. What? In line. Why? It was spectacular. They're not good. They weren't it a nostalgia good, thing? Weren't, an no. Was it a nostalgia thing? No, it wasn't even kind of. I was at. I've had it. I go to a big. Long. No, it was awful. It was horrid. Yeah, I was going to say. I didn't want it, but I was really But you hungry. waited that long. Once you get past 15, it's like, all right, well, I got to wait. You're committed. Well, waiting. you're in a line, and the problem was. We go to a big car show every year in Daytona, Thanksgiving weekend. They have the turkey oh. ride run. So we went, and then at night across the street, they have, it's called, it's new, it's called One Daytona, and it's like an outdoor mall, but they have a bunch of restaurants. But, I mean, there's so many people, like so many people. So we go over there, and like, yeah, we'll just get something to eat over there. Every restaurant, like, that you walk in, they're like, it's at least an hour away. Like, so we go to Miami Subs, and there's just a line. So we're waiting in line 15, 20 minutes, and they're like, uh, then they say, like, the lady behind the cash register, just so you know, once you order, it's a 30 to 40 minute wait to get your food. But we're already 20 minutes in. We had put our name in at our pizza place at this point already, but it had been 30 minutes. They said it'd be an hour. So I was like, whatever, we'll just wait. If we get, we made a point in the line. If we get there, then we're going to just order our subs. Well, so thank God subs. we yeah. th thank God we did though because the pizza place never even texted us. Oh. <laughs> like it was Ever. like no, never, you never canceled, never it. got Ever the got text. It. Were you just walking around? Did you have a hotel or what? What's the? We had a hotel on the beach. I feel like we live in the age of Grubhub. You yeah, know, we're calling I, we're calling ahead it's so busy. Go, I'm like, assuming that it's just everything around was going to be that regardless. Yeah, everything oh. was. You, you should have know, packed and, a lunch. And Grubhub might have worked. Back I, we should have done Uber Eats or something, no. ordered something from the beach and had them bring it to. Yes. But even to get into this place, like we were waiting in line, like because we, we had a classic cars and hot rods to get back to where all the hot rods were parked. I mean, we probably waited in line 20 minutes in our car, you know, just to get back there to get a parking spot. Oh, God. So it's just one of those places. So, yeah, I ended up waiting an hour for Miami subs. Right on. Not worth it. <laughs> Never again. That's the next good. night, we ended up going to the beach side. We ate and then came back to one day. In less than an hour. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Had right. good food. Yeah. Like, anyways, that's, so my, that's my Two story. more questions. Okay. Worth right. so, speaking of food, favorite type of food? Oh, God. I love all food. Um, Something had to pop in Italian, your mind. Italian. Okay. Probably. Yeah. Or Indian. Now, or do Mexican. you like going to a nice Italian place? No. That's, that's my thing. Like. I want like you know the a, a nice Italian place doesn't make sense to me because Italian is usually cheaper food right. like it's noodles and sauce right. like I can me, make homemade noodles so I'm not paying you uh, know an extreme amount of money for some parbadel yeah that, that like, it doesn't make any sense to me no anyway that's yeah. one of my things and the last one is the city you live in I live in Vero Beach all right paradise oh yeah made it <laughs> made it to the end of the gauntlet right on you survived all right so let's get into a little bit. Uh, kind of extreme circumstances. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just walk us through what happened to you? Okay, so um, so it's hard to say. I uh, I was just a regular everyday gal. I was a mom. I had this gorgeous son, Jackson, who was born in 2010. Everything normal, super average normal life. Um, one day, it's like a Thursday and he's running a fever and his arm hurts and I don't think anything of it. And the next day it goes away. So I don't take him to the doctor. Saturday seems kind of okay. Sunday morning he wakes up and he's slurring his words. I call my husband. I said, something's wrong with Jack. We, we got to take him in the emergency room. And I mean, there was, he had low grade fever for like a few days. Now I look back and I can see more, but it all seemed to really accumulate that week. We took him to Indy River um, Medical Center. They took his blood, and they said, there's something wrong here. You know, you need to see a specialist. You need to see a hematologist. We're going to transfer him down to, well, they were going to check. They were seeing who had an opening between Arnold Palmer, I think, in, in Orlando, mm -hmm. and Palm Beach Children's Hospital, which is down in Palm Beach. And uh, 
taken by ambulance and we start hearing words like leukemia. And um, so it turns out that he does, he has leukemia. He was five at the time. Um, and when's the first time you hear that? It was like that night, but we didn't get the confirmation, like the hard confirmation until the following Wednesday. So it was a Sunday night, a Sunday day that we took him to the hospital. Uh, they sent off, the next day they did um, what's called a bone marrow aspiration. So they take bone marrow from his spine. Or from, actually, I guess it was kind of from, it was from his back area. They send it, it, off, send it off to a hospital in Tennessee and a laboratory local. And uh, we waited and then it got lost in the mail or something like oh, that. God. <laughs> so we find, but they were able to look at his cells, just in his blood, and knew that like it was leukemia. But they wanted to know, you know, it was what kind because you have several different kinds. The bur- the best would be ALL, which is what he ended up having, and there's different ones that are just. So are they like bracing you for this over the next couple of days? Like it's probably going to come back. I mean, leukemia. we were in the PICU the first night, and by the next day, even before we had like confirmation we were on the children's oncology floor so okay. it was like okay. we so you're know. already in the process we no know. matter what just waiting for the, just waiting the hard facts see. if you so will. what goes through your mind when they tell you that i mean we just cried we i not in front of jack you know jack was sedated he needed a lot of blood um and platelets so my husband and i when we had a moment to ourselves we cried i remember the first night in the picu like we're sleeping on a hospital chair and then two of us next to each other we're in a hour and a half away from home and we're just holding on to each other, and Jack's sleeping, and we're giving him oxygen. And, um, you know, it was just a nightmare. And then we found out that he had ALL, which has a 93% uh, five-year survival rate. So it's like, you know, that's good. That's, that's the best you could get. And we're excited, but devastated. But we also knew that, you know, you you roll with the punches. You don't have a, a choice. Like, we're yeah. going to do this. We're going to do it. We're going to rock it. Like, yeah. you know, nobody's business. So he starts treatment. Um, the first 11 days we were in the hospital. Then they send us home. And he's on steroids. And he's on some chemo. We come back every week for clinic. And uh, on the 28th day, they do another aspiration. And the hope is that they're in remission. Oh, sip of water. And um, if they're in remission, great. That means that. You know, you're going to do for kids, it's about six months of frontline treatment, they call it, which is heavy, heavy chemo. And then you do three years of less intensive chemo. It's like chemo pills. And um, so nothing, I mean, that's awful. But um, we found out after 28 days that Jack did not go into remission. So that categorized him as very high risk. So it's very high risk for relapse. Um, That meant the chemo was going to be extreme and longer and he would still you know have that three-year maintenance but to get to maintenance so then November um, after a lot of chemo and a lot of hospital stays this is now about two months later we find out he is in remission so that's great so end of treatment would be November 26 2018 would have been the end of and this is 2015 so we had an end date we were excited Jack was difficult because he had, I would call it an allergy to the chemo, where every time he got chemo, he had a reaction. And not like there's horrible reactions to chemo. His reaction was fever. The problem with that is uh, kids who have cancer are what's called neutropenic, so they can get sick very, very easily. They have no, like, their immune immune system's gone, yeah. Exactly. So we had to stay in the hospital pretty much from August till May, just constantly in the hospital. And then he would be allergic to um, blood products, and then he would have allergies to uh, antibiotics. And so we were just, it was constantly being knocked down. But this kid was dancing, you know, while he's getting chemo. He's hooked up to his port, and he called his port like his Iron Man thing. And <laughs> he was really into, like, horror movies, my little five-year-old. So we got him, like, a Jason mask. So we'd be walking down the hallway in the hospital with his pole, it was Jason Mask and his like fake machete. <laughs> I, I would love to see a. Did you ever get a picture uh, of that uh, one? Because that has to be interesting for uh, other. You almost want a picture of somebody else. Like you have this. You know, he's coming down with his mask and with his. That's. And we were like, Jack, you can't scare the other kids. We I have a video of him. We're driving <laughs> down to clinic, and we're listening to the Frozen soundtrack because he loved Frozen. But he also has his 
Jason mask on and he's <laughs> singing Frozen with his hands like flailing. Yeah. And I documented all of it. We had a, a, a Facebook page called Action for Jackson, which is still up and running and everything, just keeping everybody what's going on with us. So um, he's like amazing. He's just a rock star, just so cool. And he's going to kindergarten at home. We had like a home uh, teacher that came, Mr. Honey, who was so super oh, sweet. Oh, I know. I worked you with Mr. Honey. Mr. Honey. I know Mr. Honey very well. Mr. Honey, he was just wonderful with him. We would do class on the floor with Jack and mm-hmm. just really, really sweet to him. And that was kindergarten. That was his first experience with school was, you know, homeschool. And um, so we we go through these treatments and we have amazing doctors, amazing nurses. We have an amazing outlook. We're we're, we're rocking it. And uh, in May, they're like, okay, front line's done. You're going to go into long-term maintenance. And we're like, yes, this is awesome. Uh, we had a little house and had an amazing summer. And I signed Jack up for school. It would be at uh, now Treasure Coast Elementary. He starts school. Um, he did get a cold. So the beginning of the year, September, um, he had to go back into the hospital. And we had had about three months, which was the longest stretch of time we ever had. When, since this diagnosis where he was at home, you know, see a world and things. Um, so he goes to school. Things are going well, except for the one week where he had a, a, like a fever. And so we were out of school. And then we were doing half days at school because he was very, very tired. And he had a lot of like joint pain and everything. But he was getting that experience, which was really cool. Who was his first grade teacher? Miss Murray. Okay. I, I worked at Treasure Coast. Oh. So when you when you told me the Facebook page, I remembered because I remember Miss Murray had it out there and I have actually met Jackson. I remember. Oh my so God. that's just, it's just I, I didn't know that, but now that's interesting that I'll that's no quit. That was yes. when I saw that as the school's logo, I was like, Ooh, it's amazing. It's for us. I mean, it was just so many things that were just seemed like they were talking to us. It was just awesome. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just went oh, I no. made that connection. Yep, it's like Miss Murray. I and actually met Jackson. Oh, oh I'm so, so that's you uh, met him. He was such a happy, cool little kid, and just, um, just love him. Um, so he uh, goes to school, and then in late September, his blood work was wonky. So they're like, "Okay, let's let's take a look. We'll do a you know bone marrow aspirate." And this is we've been through like just the gauntlet of things, and I was nervous, um, but Jack, you know, he was never he never went according to plan. So I was just like, "Oh, it's fine." But it turned out that the leukemia was back, and we knew that's not good because you know it's. Uh, we knew he was very high risk for relapse, but it's after treatment's done is mm-hmm. what we expected. Like you know, if he's going to relapse, it'll be because he's not getting the chemo. Well, now he's getting the chemo, and he's gone through all this, and it's back. So we're like, all right, well that's fine. We are going to get a bone marrow transplant. I mean, whatever it takes, we'll get there, and it's fine. Um, so we signed up for Be The Match. We had everybody we know sign up for Be The Match. And um, we got found out we actually had a donor. And so, all right, we're going to do another 28 days of treatment, get this into remission, and go towards going down to Miami for a uh, bone marrow transplant. And then he didn't go into remission. And at this time, it was a very crazy time. We had tried, my husband and I, for a very long time to have another child. And it didn't happen. And I had several miscarriages and then we decided we this is good because if I had more kids I wouldn't be able to be every single night and I never stayed away from him like I was never he always had a parent in the hospital with him at all times and we didn't have to worry so much about depriving our other children because there weren't any so find out Jack's um relapsed and we also found out that I was expecting so I was like you know, this crazy time, and um, then we find out that he didn't go into remission, and the same day I found out he hadn't gone into remission, I heard my baby's heartbeat for the first time, and it was just this juxtaposition. So it's just like the emotions I can't imagine. It was like this juxtaposition of, like, something I'd wanted for so long, this extreme hope, and then realizing that if he's not in remission, we can't get a bone marrow transplant. We we don't know what's going to happen. And we hadn't told Jack because we had told him about a previous pregnancy and, and I had miscarried. And it was just very, very sad for him because he wanted a sibling. But now I, I'm past the three-month mark. I have a heartbeat. And so I go home and I'm, I'm devastated. I'm just so upset but excited too. And I'm like, all right, Jack, you know, let's have dinner. Let's have a table. 
And he didn't, he didn't want to, like, he was like, no, I'm playing my video games. And I'm like, come on, Jack, I've got, uh, we've got some stuff we've got to talk to because we were going to have to check back into the hospital on Monday and he wasn't going to go back to school. And like, things were just very much up in the air. And I'm like, come on, Jack, let's, uh, let's get, let's get some dinner. And he's like, no, I, I'm really, I don't want to. I'm like, um, don't you want to know where I was today? He's like, you're at the hospital. I'm like, yeah, we were all at the hospital, but then I, I went somewhere else. Do you want to know where I went? He's like, where well, I'm like. Do you want to hear? Because I had one of those. Uh, I picked up a Doppler. A Doppler. Oh, I right picked on. up a Doppler. I'm like, do you want to hear your baby brother or sister's heartbeat? He goes, Mom, you're pregnant. Why didn't you tell me? And I'm like, oh, I just did. He's like, that's great. Can I name the baby? <laughs> <laughs> right away. <laughs> right away. And we're like, you know what? Yeah, you you can name the baby. And he's like, all right. I'm like, well, what do you what do you think? He's like, I've already planned it. What do oh, he, already, yeah. he already had yeah, this planned yeah. out. He had this in the in the bag. Yeah. And at that point, you got to go in your head oh, like, oh my well, gosh, like, what did I just do? Oh, what did I just <laughs> agree to? Yeah. So if it's a girl, he wants to name her Julia, and I'm like, that's gorgeous. I yes. love I, Julia. Yeah. Okay. And he says, if it's a boy, Thompson. Okay. I'm like, Thompson. What, where well, did that say, come from? That, yeah. It said my brain. Now, the <laughs> funny thing is, we do, we have a boy. His name is Thompson. Our last name is Hunter. So my brother, Anthony, was like, are you going to give him the middle name S, something with an S, because of Thompson S. Hunter, the gonzo journalist? Yeah. Oh, I, Girl I Loathing see. in Las Vegas? Yes. Okay, so the guy who wrote he that, wrote his the book. name is Hunter okay. S. Thompson. Okay. <laughs> Oh, so no. it was like a reverse. Yeah. Did you yeah. give him the S? No, oh. we gave him uh, the middle name is Knife, which is even better. It's uh, my son's oncologist's first name. He's from Syria. Oh, okay. interesting. All right. So it's Thompson and Hunter. But I was like, oh, well, maybe it'll be a girl. <laughs> <laughs> In that moment, you're like, oh, interesting. Uh, I love it now. I mean, he's, he's, he is a Thompson, but I was yeah. like, sure. So he names the baby. Um, I, well, I'm thinking in the mind of a seven-year-old, I think he did I was. Good. I think I was going to say that, too. Like, it, you know, Raphael or like a Ninja Donatello. Turtle. Donatello. Yes. You never like, know what you're going to get. You know, Barney might have been yeah. popular. You know, I you know, have like, a oh, friend Barney. who named one of her twin sisters Shira. Okay. Because she got to name the other one. Uh, her parents named one and she got to name her twin sister Shira. The baby. Yeah. So I'm like, I could have ended up with like an Iron Man or. Because, yes. Yeah. So I've got a Thor. Thompson. You could have got a Thor. I could have gotten a Thor. That could have been, there, you know, that's there not, so yeah. many. It definitely could have went any direction. Any so I, I think, <laughs> think Corey's right. I think you, you did pretty good. Yeah, I, I think from the mind of a seven-year-old, I think you did pretty good. It's not bad. Yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. So. Um, <laughs> my wife works with seven-year-olds. She's a teacher as well. And I can think of most of them are not coming up with Thompson. I think you're going to get Olaf. Or something, oh, you definitely. know, sparkles. Ben. My daughter will name st stuff, and she likes to use the word sparkles in the name all the time. Yeah. This is spark. I'm like, <laughs> okay, so yeah, you could <laughs> have gotten a lot of different yeah. outcomes there. It's a, it's a great name, and we love it. But so he, he's very excited. We go into the hospital, and we start, um, we start the next phase, which is going to be an immunotherapy called blinatumumab. So it is a, a he had to go. We had to go down, my, down to Miami Hospital where they um, gave him a pick line because all this time he's had a port. So it's like this uh, thing in his chest. Yeah. So now he's got to get a pick line because the blinotumumab is going to run 24-7 for about four weeks. And it's an immunotherapy drug. Um, he was only like the 500th patient, patient or something to get it. And it was very experimental. Um, and a lot of people saw great results. We actually, his, um, his, leukemia count I think at the time when he relapsed it was at 23 at 28 days it was up to 37 so that's not great he was getting chemotherapy and it was still growing um so he starts the blind atumumab after we go to and also when we went to Palm Beach or uh, Miami's Children's Hospital they decided as like a precautionary me measure they were going to extract his t-cells while he still had t-cells to extract in case we have to go to different hospital and try um, an immunotherapy called CART T-cell therapy. So they extract his T-cells, he gets the PICC line, we start the blind now. And again, the fevers start within like three days, which is what continually happened when Jack would get any kind of chemo or drug or anything. So we're inpatient and um, he starts developing a growth on his jaw. And at first we thought, you know, Chemo destroys teeth, so we're like, maybe it's, he's got a cavity, maybe it's, you know, it just, 
it could have been a gazillion things we're thinking. So we see a dentist in the hospital and it's not that. And they do a blood smear and something looks kind of wonky. So they, they do an extraction and, and the doctor says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is leukemia. And I, we have to stop the blind now. Um, we, they did a lot of like MRIs and CAT scans and everything like that. Turns out the blino had gotten his um, leukemia down to 1.4%, which was amazing. But because of the growth in his jaw, which was leukemia, they had to stop it. So then we, um, we find out it's leukemia at the same time. We have to get approved now to go to either Seattle Children's Hospital or Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to pursue CART. Uh, it's last-ditch measure. I mean, we can't get him into remission, so there's no chance of getting... Mm-hmm. Um, a transfusion, or um, sorry, um, so we get denied, and so I go on Jack's page. You know, Jack has been on the news a couple times, and he's very well known, and he's got a lot of fans, as he calls them. And so, I, you know, went on to his Facebook page, and I'm like, "This is the insurance, and this is the person who denied Jack the chance to go to to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to receive this, and it's a trial. It's not something that they they would." The insurance would have to pay for is for him to stay at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for the regular care, not for the trial, not for anything having to do with that. It would just be for him to be a patient at CHOP. And at this point, because I'm no longer working and my husband is now no longer working, he's on Medicaid, so it was Medicaid denial. So, I mean, Marco Rubio, he had somebody call us to see what they can do to figure this out. Um, the news channels were calling us. I had, I don't know if I'm allowed, the Nicholas, like there was just a very a large amount of people. They, they crashed the server of this guy who denied oh, wow. Jack Taquan and, and um, we called it Jackson's army. And so within a day and a half, they reversed the decision. So now we're going to chop. And this is really exciting because I'm from the Philadelphia area. This is, you know, where I grew up and this is me returning home. Um, so it took us a while. So they had the extracted the T cells, thank God. But then it turns out you have to wait for your, your place for them to see you. They do like an exam and everything like that. And then, um, then they start working on your T cells. So they send them off to the lab. And so, I mean, this is November. I was going to say he, he was two, 2015, he was five, is that? 2015 I mean, is five. And then now what time is this at this point? This gone is through? now, um, this is, I'm mean, going to be about November, December, 2016. So okay. six, um, we've spent, I mean, we've spent his last two Christmases and his last two Thanksgivings in the hospital, which is amazing. If you want to donate toys to your local hospital for children, you should because they make Christmas really, really magical for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is, I think it's, around it's right after thanksgiving and right before christmas so we know that we're going to go at cart but we have to wait for a chance to go there and get approved by now the children's hospital of philadelphia they've agreed to see him so now we're just pumping him full of chemo in order to keep him stable in order to get him just to get there just to get, to there. get there and um so now it's january and we're getting ready and to is go. he He's getting all this chemo. Is he able to like get up out of bed still or? So what we didn't know at the time and what we do now know, Jack had a, um, I think it's a gene deficiency. It's called the MTHFR gene, gene mutation. So the biggest chemo that you get when you have leukemia is a, a drug called methotrexate. When you have the MTFHR, MTFHR gene mutation, your body can't break down um, folic acid and methotrexate is like extremely high folic acid. So it's accumulating in his joints and it's accumulating in his brain and it's accumulating all over his body, but we don't know that's what is happening necessarily. Um, so he's having a lot of trouble walking. Um, he's getting physical therapy for it, but it's, he's, he's up and about. I mean, he's dancing still in bed and we're in the wheelchair and we're doing physical therapy and his spirits are high. You would not know that this kid is so incredibly sick. And that, and that I, I don't know, like you, you hear that a, like a lot. I think as a child, we they have such a better outlook mm-hmm. on life. I know, and they still have, you know, that excitement. And I think that's kind of, when you hear the stories, it's nice mm-hmm. to hear that part of it because 
you know, as an adult, when we get sick, we kind of pout and mope. But as a kid, they'll they'll go right through it. They're so a, relentless. They are. It's amazing. I read a story about a woman who had a pediatric cancer, but she was an adult, but she had to be treated in a children's hospital. And she was like, I don't want to be around adults with cancer. Not to say, you know, negative, but the outlook of viewing it through a child's eyes and just what they're able to go through. I mean, he went from being on steroids to gaining like, you know, a good 20 pounds on a tiny little five-year-old's body to then being so underweight that they had to like put him on medicine to get him to eat and like oh. all within two months. And just yeah, like so much, they pump you full of chemo mm-hmm. and you're having fevers and you're throwing up and you're, but then. Now you're going through this as a mom for so long at this point do you become numb to any of it like when they start telling you things are you do you just like think your own like thoughts or are you hanging on every word that they give you i'm hanging definitely on every word that they give me i'm also not at all expecting like i'm just like that's fine and not that it's fine but it's like well we'll just have to deal with that we're just gonna deal it when we're you know now, are you like researching everything uh-huh. and like Googling? Mm-hmm. So not, not the expectancy rates. Once we found out Jack was very high risk, when we knew he was ALL, I'm like, oh, 93% survival rate. Great. Very high risk. Um, don't tell me. Cause yeah. I, and at that point we realized it was about a 40% chance of, so, but yeah. I didn't, I didn't hear that. Yeah. And that was not something that mattered because not my kid, you know, yeah. my kid will be fine. And my kid. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I would I think, think you I, almost need that mindset okay. so that you can be strong right. for yourself, for your family, for him. And so. exactly. And it wasn't about me. It was like if if it yeah. was up to me, if it was just me, if it was me going through it, then I could, you know, curl up in a ball and boo hoo poor me. But I'm watching this this amazing little boy be happy and excited and funny and just cracking up his nervousness and like just always being optimistic. I'm I'm not gonna be sad for me like that's yeah. ridiculous when it's almost not fair it's, you know? but i mean whoever said life was fair yeah you know that was for me it was like yeah. you know i could say oh this is not fair this is not fair it's life isn't fair. yeah but it's almost not fair for you to be exactly boohooing in the exactly. corner while he's there right taking it you know and handling it like a champ he's looking to us you know how are we reacting and yeah. if we're going to be just fearful and upset and sad then that's what he's i want to lead by example so you're going to be fine yeah this is going to be fine and we're going to deal with everything you know as a family and strong and we don't give up kids definitely feel that from the parents i feel like if anybody knows somebody it's their kids their kids they figure it out their parents better than anybody else. oh absolutely even probably within each other it's amazing how they know that for sure and and that's why that's that was our outlook and so um so now it's like December and we are close. It must have been close to January and we realized that we're going to Philadelphia. But now Jack is so neutropenic that we can't travel to Philadelphia um, on a commercial air. And if we drive now because he's on um, a study of sorts, we would have to drive and be within a children's oncology group hospital at all times. We'd have to be within an hour or two. So, so you'd have to like strategically make your right. stops. So now we're like, I, I put on Jack's pa- Facebook page. I'm like, we're going to Philadelphia. Yay. And if anybody knows somebody with a private jet that wants to get us there, that would be great. And um, so it turned out that we knew somebody with a private jet who <laughs> <laughs> flew him there. And at this point, I think, I don't know if he had been on the news yet. We had uh, WPTV came and did a story on him, Marco Rubio. I and, remember some of it. Now, I didn't know, but knowing the connection with Murray and then as she was sharing that with our faculty, oh, so we were able to kind of fall in. So it, I remember some of that now, so I do remember that, yeah. We, yeah, so we were on the news for WPTV Channel 5. Um, they came and, and talked to Jack and like did this whole story on Jack and Jackson's army. And then um, when we found out we were going to get the plane, uh, this guy, and I to this day, I don't know who owned the plane. I do know the pilot who approached his boss and was like hey he's you know he's been piloting for him forever and it's a a philadelphia local guy and turns out like my friend was friends with him and i'm Mm -hmm. still very close we call him miracle mike um he was able to get us this private jet to go to philadelphia and we get off the plane there and there's our fox channel channel 29 which i grew up with was like there to Mm -hmm. greet us at the plane and meet jack and talk to him and it was very very exciting and and 
for him, it's like, I'm never going to be, for me, I'm never going to be on a private plane again and everything. For him, he's just like, it's a Tuesday. Yeah. (laughs) Happens. And um, so we get to chop. They meet Jack. They do all the test work and everything like that. And um, so they're like, okay, we're going to defrost those T-cells. We're going to uh, activate them. And then we'll see you back probably in March or February. So this is about January. We go back to the hospital and things are just. So you have to come back to Florida? We, so we actually, yeah, we were lucky. We got to fly back to Florida. Um, Miracle Mike flew us back. And so we get back and we're in the hospital now again. And it's about a month more in the hospital, in our home hospital, which he just, he loved everybody there. He had crushes on the nurses. What hospital is that? It's Palm Beach Children's Hospital. Okay. Uh, attached to St. Mary's. So we're back home now. And um, we're there for about a month. And Jack's doing physical therapy and everything, but he's just deteriorating. And so, again, we didn't really know about the methotrexate being so bad for him. What it was doing to him because, there, of, his, because of the mutation on right. his... Right. I mean, methotrexate itself, it's you don't want to take a lot of it. It's a chemotherapy drug, so it's kids that receive it you know later on in life they'll have secondary cancers this is not something but it is our best weapon against leukemia at this point um so we're getting tons and tons of methotrexate in his spinal fluid because he now has um spinal leukemia it's everywhere and it's just getting worse and worse uh we finally get discharged it's like february 24th i think And our hospital does this whole flash mob for Jack. And it was just really, really cool. And and this time around, because he's no longer on any kind of protocol, we can just drive straight. uh, That's nice. Yeah, so we didn't have to worry about flying back up there. And so we were able to run a minivan. And just drive straight. You didn't up. want to try to get Miracle Mike up back I on the just, jet? I, I don't know. I felt I mean, so bad about even. No. I'm like, I don't even want to know how much this is going to cost in fuel. And, and, and he, I'm sure he was willing to, but it was like, we can no, just drive. No, that's definitely and, a miracle, but it is nice that you can actually drive. Nice. Too, so. it, was, it was nice. And we had such a nice little drive, you know, and a really magical time. We get to Philadelphia. Um, I'm now at this point, I think I was seven months pregnant. And I don't have a plan because we're only supposed to be there about six weeks. So he's there for a week before he's going to get his T cells March 7th. And we should find out by April 7th, whether or not it worked. And a week after that home, my due date was like May 11th or 12th. And we were just going to drive back home. And I'm like, well, we're just going to, we're winging it. It's going to be fine. Um, so, and then things aren't fine. Um, he got the T cells and when you get this, this T cell therapy, you're going to get what they call encephalopathy and it's, um, it's bad. And a lot of kids get put into comas for it, like medically induced coma and everything, because you're getting really, really low or high blood pressure and you're getting very, very high fevers and you're, they're not all there. And sometimes it can last a week and sometimes it can last a month and they just don't know because I mean, at this point, Emily Whitehead was the very first um, child to get it. Uh, and they've done, I mean, I can't remember exactly, but Jack was, this is early stages and not a lot of kids and every kid is different. And it also matters how much disease they have. And Jack at this point is at 93% leukemia. So it's high. Uh, so we knew the encephalopathy was going to be bad. And it was bad. And then it was really bad. And, um, It was encephalopathy, but it was also methotrexate toxicity, which we didn't know until later. So it got such to a level that it became just toxic for him in that case. He lost the ability to use his hands and his arms and and speak. And at first, like, he was intubated. And this is, they told us this would most likely happen. They would intubate him. They would put him in a coma. And uh, hopefully within a week or two, he'd be out of it. So after, I think it was like a week, they extubate him. And you know, he's able to move his arms and he gives us the thumbs up and then we're doing physical therapy with him and getting him to swallow and he's having a lot of trouble breathing. And I mean, he said to me at one point, he was actually able to speak and uh, he had his first sip of water and he looked at me and goes, delicious. And I remember when I was next to his bed and he was intubated and I was just like, I just want to hear him. You know, just please let him get through this. I want to talk to my boy again. And I remember being just so 
hopeful and elated and just like, this is, this is good. Um, and then he just, his birthday was March 30th and he was really unable to sit up. He had gone from being able to sit up and somewhat talking to just no longer able to speak. He wasn't able to take his pills. He wasn't able to swallow. Um, he stopped being able to use the bathroom and it just kept deteriorating. We didn't know what was going on. And the doctors didn't know what was going on because they had not seen this before. And so the main doctor there is Dr. Grupp, and he is like world renowned. He is uh, the most prolific hung, uh, pediatric oncologist. And he's talking to us and saying, I don't know. So I'm saying, all right, I'm going to look into this. And I'm. I mean, I'm Googling, I'm a Google doctor, but <laughs> I told him, I'm like, you know, I see this, it has to do with like methotrexate toxicity, possibly, can we try this drug and this drug, it's like Lucavorn or something. And he's like, well, you know, it's, uh, we haven't tried it, but let me talk to our neurologist, let me talk to this guy and we'll talk about it. And they end up giving him this drug that, you know, cause they were very, they were not, not tuning my own horn, but it was like, they were willing to do anything. And so he starts being able to lift his hands and these different things, and it was like, awesome, this is great. Um, so now we're into May, and um, I'm nine months pregnant, and and uh, University of Pennsylvania is right next door. It's like, everybody kept asking me, what are you going to do? I'm like, oh, I'll just, I'll just walk on over next door and just say, hey, can I, uh, can I have this baby? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had not, I had not seen a doctor. Well, there's a lot of doctors around. So there are yeah. doctors, and, and one of the nurses were like, you know, we actually have this underground tunnel that can take you right across. She's like, it's scary, but I'm sure at that point, if you need us to, like, you're not going to notice. I'm like, that'll be great. <laughs> um, so he's not doing great. He's not, he's no longer on a ventilator. And um, I mean, we went through so much the, his, his trachea, his, they thought they were going to have to put a trach in because he had swollen so much in in his throat and they didn't know why. And so they were they started off with giving him helium. And then, you know, they were just like, Well, maybe it'll be a trach and maybe it'll be this and, and just not knowing what the heck. At that point it sounded like they were just kind of Oh, they were throwing anything at the wall and seeing what yeah. stuck. And it's not because it's not it's no, the it's greatest just, hospital was, for children in the world. It was just where it's just you were at that point. Exactly time. who Jack is and, and just how he reacted to everything. Um so May May seventh, I leave the hospital and I'm like, I'm gonna we had a hotel that uh Novartis was is a drug company and they were funding this research and this this mm -hmm. test so they actually gave us a hotel which we never used but I was like I'm gonna go back to the hotel because I don't feel good and um I watched the crown and I was in contact with my husband and everything and um I started having like contractions at like 11 o'clock at night and I'm like but when I was pregnant with Jack I had contractions went to the hospital they sent me home I was petrified to go back, waited, went back, and I was fully dilated, but he wouldn't descend, so it was like another six hours. I'm like, I've got time. This is fine. It's fine. And then at like 4 o'clock in the morning, I called up my husband. I'm like, I think I waited too long. Oh, he's like, that was a minute apart. Are you kidding me? So he calls Uber because he's at CHOP, and we're about like three miles away. And he calls Uber. Uber never shows up, so he runs to the hospital. And at this point, I'm like, I'm not going to go downstairs. I'm just going to have the baby here. It'll be fine. It's fine. I just, <laughs> he's like, I called an Uber. We're going to the hospital. I'm like, oh, yeah, I just watched this thing on Sunday morning. You can't take an Uber to the hospital anymore. They'll kick you out. He's like, no, we're going to do it. <laughs> we get to UPenn, and there's, like, a metal detector there because it's, you know, it's Philadelphia. And my husband's got like, I don't know what in his pockets, but he can't figure out what's in his pockets. He keeps going Something's through going and make, beep, 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 go and going through. Oh, and gosh. I'm just like, I'm filling out paperwork. I'm like, you better get through this for real. We get upstairs and two seconds later, like, oh, I think we've got like, you know, she's about eight centimeters. We've got time. And he's walking to, uh, everybody left the room except for one nurse. And he's walking over to give the nurse the paperwork. And he's like, there's a head. And then <laughs> pops out Thompson, and there we have a baby. It's May 8th. Are you in the ER at this point? Or? No, we made it up to the not OB labor and delivery. Oh. But, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, they're trying to, like, you know, give me an IV and this and that. But You made it far enough. I yeah. made it far <laughs> enough that it was not, like, you know, projectile baby onto the, the <laughs> ER floor. But it was, you know. It wasn't like a touchdown. Not, was, no. did, I kind of Did a nurse catch yeah. or did a doctor catch? Um, I 
It was the nurse. Yeah. I know. So I know everybody gonna... came running back and we're like, whoa, hello. So we had Thompson. It was very exciting. And um, uh, Eric went, my husband Eric went over and, and showed Jack pictures and he was able to smile, which was like so beautiful because he, 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 was, in, he was in a lot of pain and it was a very, he was there mentally. He was very well aware of everything happening but he couldn't talk and he couldn't move. And so it was, it was frustrating to him. Um, and the next day we brought over the baby for him to meet his brother and he was very, you know, excited. And so we started talking about um, transferring home because at this point he is now, uh, as of April 7th, leukemia is gone, which is what we were there for. It killed the leukemia. So great. Okay. Um, how do we get Jack back? Well, Things aren't working here, but, you know, we can work with physical therapists and we can either decide to try and stay in Philadelphia um, or we can bring him back home. And we're deciding these things. And uh, we noticed that Jack's now got... And we found out April 7th that or April 8th that the leukemia was gone. Now, Thompson's born May 8th. So it's now another month and we've been there two months. Um, we noticed petechia on his hands and his arms and that's bruising it's mm -hmm. like dotted bruising and that's a major sign of leukemia we my husband brings it up to somebody at some point and they're like eh, i'm sure it's nothing it's fine because he was they were wrapping him in a lot of different things to kind of get his joints moving his muscles from atrophy and everything like that and the one person was not very very nice about it but um we had an inkling you know we were it was the alarms were set and um so now we're a couple more days in and they do do a blood smear and they do notice that the leukemia is back. And so that but they quickly, don't, that quickly. And, um, they bring us to this room, you know, they come in, I can't remember. We, we were talking the night before we were saying that, you know, I don't remember, I don't think they did an aspiration, but maybe they did. So it's all kind of jumbled now. And, um, it's May 17th. And they come in in the morning, and they're like, you know, can we talk to you? Uh, let's leave the room, and let's go talk down the hall. And they're, they're like, you know, they, we wanted somebody to come and sit with Jack. And they were like, well, we'll have somebody sit with the baby. And I'm like, no, no, I'll, I'll take the baby with me. I'm using her, him like a shield or something. Like, you can't, you can't do anything to me. I'm holding a baby. It's yeah. fine. And they tell us that the leukemia is back. And at this point... Um, and back, backtracking when Jack got the T cells, they inject it into, you know, your port and everything. It's fine. He had a reaction to it. So, and they weren't sure if it was anaphylaxis or not, but they gave him an EpiPen just in case. Um, and that kind of, that wiped out the idea that we could possibly do the T cells again because he still had some T cells left, but you know, that was my first question. I'm like, okay, can we, can we do the T cells again? And they're like, it's, you know, if it didn't work, you know, if it came back this quickly, it's, it's, it's not going to work. And um, we said, you know, that's, that's, that's it. We're, you know, you're done. Everything, you have to start considering, um, do you want to bring him home and put him on hospice? Um, we said, yeah, that's, we want to take him home. And uh, went back to our room and, uh, cried and hugged, and uh, then um, we both decided we had to call our families, and so I went into the bathroom so that Jack wouldn't hear, and uh, my husband went downstairs, and so we contacted our families and said... So you're still at the hospital at this We're point? at CHOP now. Yeah, we're I'm still at Children's child. Hospital Philadelphia, and we're 1,200 miles away from home, and... Um, and my family, my family had come up for Jack's birthday, and when he was first intubated, they had flown up, and uh, my husband's father and, and his sister had come up for Jack's birthday in the hospital, so people were coming to see us and everything, but at this point, my mom had flown up, and she was helping me with the baby and coming by um, for that, so she, when, when Thompson was actually born, she came to the hospital and sat with Jack so Eric could be there um, for me to give birth, and so... 
you know, but at that point I said, I told my mom, I'm like, I'm not ready to see anybody. You know, you can come tomorrow and we're going to talk about a care flight, taking him home. We're going to take him home. We're going to do physical therapy. We're going to try whatever it takes. Like we're not giving up. We're coming home. That's, that's it. And so we spent the night, um, talking to Jack and he had just a horrible, he had a horrible night. He was in a lot of pain. And the next morning they came in and they said, we don't think you can go home. We don't think he has a lot of time left. If you have family that can come, you probably want to get them here. Um, so, and we knew it. I mean, we just knew. And it wasn't like we weren't giving up so much as we had put him through so much. And he was in so much pain. And it was like, I, I don't know how to explain it. Um because I think a lot of people, I mean, there's so many instances in my situation where people are like, well, I just don't know how you do it, and I don't know how, and everybody has an opinion, and it's like, you know, how could you just accept that? And it's, something just comes over you when you know. Like, I knew a lot of times, like, we can do this, and we can do that, and we can fight this. But I knew at this point, like, it was, and had he lived, he, the way he was living, that wasn't Jack, that wasn't, if, if I thought, and if the leukemia didn't come back, we would have worked day and night to get him back to himself. But the leukemia was back. His body and his gray matter just degenerated so much from the methotrexate toxicity and from the encephalopathy. And he was just, he was so sad. And he just, it it was the right thing to do. And, 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 and in the end, we didn't have a choice. Yeah, I was about right. to say, yeah. Yeah. You don't it wasn't a, like something, yeah. That, it wasn't that, like you had a bunch of options. Or well, yeah, yeah, I mean, for somebody to say that, how could you give, that's not the case. No, it was, and it wasn't the case. And I, I mean, we didn't, we didn't have a lot of negative. I think you had to live in that moment. You yeah. had to take that moment for what that's, it was. And that's not giving up. That's no. embracing the moment that's so that you have that moment. Acceptance, right? Like, it's exactly, I mean, I, the, if you're talking about stages of grief and everything, there's certain things. And I, I almost had acceptance in that moment where it was like, I'm going to, I'm, I love him so much that I'm going to do what's best for him and not what's best for me. Right. I think so many times, you know, you have somebody that you love so much and, and, you know, you can prolong their life, but it's not a life. We didn't even have the option to prolong his life, but. I wanted him to be at peace and I wanted to give him the most honorable and his, his best, the death that he deserved. And, mm -hmm. and so that was his family. You know, my parents came and my husband's sisters came and, um, my sisters were, uh, flew up that morning. We played his favorite music. We put on his favorite shows. Uh, I myself am not religious. I grew up Catholic, but you know, as so many of us do, I, I kind of lapsed. And so he wasn't baptized, but he had this love of Jesus, which was just, you know, all his. And so we decided to have him baptized and um, had a really, really beautiful little ceremony. And the minister that came was just brilliant. And so it was this very beautiful death. And then at the end of it, my husband's mother, and we had not really spoken to his husband, my husband's mother a lot, uh, she was going through a very difficult time. She came up. She said goodbye to him. And um, everybody left. And Jack's breath got really labored. And it was very, and we knew it was it was coming. And so a lot of things happened. But in the end, you know, I had my hand on his heart. And we had told him earlier in the day, um, we had taken him off the medicine that was giving him some ability in his hands and just was only on painkillers and things that would make him comfortable. And we told him early in the day, we love you and it's whenever you're ready, Jack, you can just, you you can go and we will we'll meet you there. It's, it's okay. And so through this time when we knew it was, it was coming, I had my hand on my heart. He was in our arms and we just kept telling him it's okay, Jack, and we love you and it's okay. And he had this really, this moment he was breathing very heavily, and he opened his eyes, and it was the first time in months that he opened his eyes, and he looked into mine, and he saw me, and he hadn't seen me, you know, and I hadn't seen him in so long, and I, he saw me, and, um, and he was gone, 
And that was like 1036. And so we're sitting there and this calm came over us, this complete calm. And Thompson now is asleep next to us in a basket. I called it a basket. It was a laundry basket with a pillow in it. And he's <laughs> 10 days old and he's sleeping. And all of a sudden, and he'd slept the whole day and just had been, you know, a great newborn baby. And moments after Jack's heart stopped, Thompson starts laughing, just this baby cooing laughing. And my husband and I looked at each other and we're like, it's Jack's playing with him. He finally gets to like interact with his brother. And we just knew. And so it was this, there it was, you know, that was, so um, we called everybody and let them know. And then we invited them up to the hospital to, say goodbye and we had a lot of I mean a lot of packing to do and everything so my sisters my husband's sister and my parents came up and they sat with Jack and said goodbye to him and held him and we sat around and we talked and talked and just told the best Jack stories and just did the you know and it was it was crazy because you know here we had uh, these doctors that were coming up to to give us condolences. I mean, it's now 11, 12 o'clock and Dr. Grubb is coming up and Dr. Maud are coming up and, you know, came from home to say goodbye to us. And we're smiling, we're laughing and it felt insane at the time, but they said, no, that's, that's the best thing that you can do because I mean, it's not real. And at the same time, it was like, all of that's going to come. But right now, like, living in that moment of just what a beautiful person that he was and how much joy he brought everybody. It just felt so appropriate. So that, um, that was, so that was May, uh, 18, 2017. Jack passed away and now we're in Philadelphia and we have to get home. And, uh, I mean, a lot of things happen. And so really what the podcast, I guess was supposed to be, was about grieving, but grieving with gratitude and, Going on from this moment, my son has died, and I'm at a loss for what, you know, is going to happen. But I knew from that moment, I knew that I didn't want it to be, you know, he can't go on. He's not able to be here. So this is the life that I'm given has to be lived for him in honor of him because it was such an honor to be his mother, and that's what I've tried to do every day since. Um, just being not only present for my my, my children now, because we have a, a six-month-old Harrison, um, as well as Thompson, but to do things that would honor Jack every day. You know? So that's what we've been trying to do. It's, it's heavy. Yeah, but, yeah, I, I mean... You know, I, I, yeah, no, I was going to say, like, it, it, it's like just hearing the story for me, you know, and I came in late, but it, it's heavy. It's like somebody just cut onions in here, you know, <laughs> but it, it, yeah, my hat's off to you. Th- our, like our podcast, like tagline, if you will, is ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And I feel like Jackson is the epitome of that. Absolutely. He just an ordinary kid and he had a circumstance that he had to battle and he did it with all Everything he had grit, yep. with yes. his <laughs> with his Jackson's army and then like with his Iron Man will, if you will, mm-hmm. and his Jason's mask with frozen music. I mean, like that, I just think about those things and that he still kept going through it. And I mean, to the end, it, we were uh, in the hospital and he was no longer able to move and this and that. And my husband was showing him this really ridiculous B movie and <laughs> he can't talk or anything like that but he's watching this. What was the name of the movie? Oh my gosh, I wish remember. I could remember. It's it's like a, it was a short like half hour long. My, my husband's going to kill me that I can't remember it. <laughs> I just only ask because we have a friend that is loves B-movies. It's you know? like so, a short oh, one and it point, was yeah. so ridiculous. Yeah, if Jimmy's ever had, watched like, it. Or, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to get it from you. We'll have to get it from you and then see if he's, if he's seen it. Yeah. And he's laughing and it was just like to hear his laugh with everything that you know he had going on and he's laughing at this ridiculous movie and it's like and we knew he was in pain and we knew he was having trouble breathing and he can't move but he was still able to giggle and just be ridiculous and be jack and that was i mean that's i i constantly think back to when things are hard for me you know 
of everything that he went through. And it was like, I, I think, I think you can get through today. You, you have to. Yeah. So it, it's an understandable way to get through it, I guess, as uh, from your side, you know, if and you think about everything that he went through. Yeah. I think it's, and it, it puts in perspective everybody else's quote unquote problems, right? Like he was able to go through something so heavy and like we complain about the little things sometimes and it's like, you know what? I mean, as we should, we're, it's but not. it's good to know, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, sorry, okay. but it's good to, you need to understand that there's always, there's always could be something worse. So right. it's, it, you need to accept that and just work through it like Jackson did. Exactly. I mean, and it's, and like you did, so and your husband did. so grateful for the life that we have and not to, not to say I'm not a saint and this has not been an easy road. I mean, we've had a lot of difficulties. It's, it's been mourning is it's a, it's a process. There's no right way or wrong way to grieve and there is no roadmap for it. You know, I mean, they talk about the, the stages of grief. Well, I never went through anger and I never tried to bargain. Like it was, you know, I had acceptance. I had extreme sadness, but you know, there is an idea of how you're supposed to grieve and then there's how you grieve. And not everybody is going to do it the same way. And especially in my marriage, I had to accept that. That You know, here you think, I love my son and my husband loved my son. And so we loved him the same. We should grieve the same. And that's not, not the case. how it works. It's, that's not life, you yeah. know. And if you want to be inspired and you want to be inspiring, you know, there's so many grieving parents out there and it's, especially this time of year, you know, during the holidays, I think people, they don't know how to react to somebody who's grieving and, uh, we're just regular people. Some of us, there are, there are people that are just doing extraordinary things, uh, over on the West coast. There's a child who, uh, his name was Benji. It was a very similar case to my son. And, Benji also died. Within two days, his parents set up a fund. It's called the Benjamin Gilkey Fund for Innovative Cancer Research. That it's out of uh, all Children's Hospital, John Hopkins. That they're they're raising money and changing actual treatments for kids. You know, they they took their grief, this extreme loss, and they turned it into something that's just out of this world. Like that inspires me. That is. Mm-hmm the person I want to be it's like you take something that is so dark and so you know how how are you going to get through this how you don't give yourself the option and and you try very very hard to make the life that you're living worthy of the life that they lost kind of deal that's my way of thinking absolutely you want to go with final sure so we always end with a question and I will I'll, I'll probably butcher it we never say it the same way I'll get it but no, you got it on. You got yeah. it. I was going to go ahead. If you, go ahead. You, all right. Corey's taking you, over. You kind of have extraordinary life experience mm-hmm. just based on what you've been through. But based on your life experiences, what is the most important piece of advice you think you can give to people listening? I mean, it's such a, it's a, don't sweat the small stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like there are so many big things happening out there. There are so many things that, that you know, could come into your life at any moment. Like it's not promised. So these little things that just irk people and that they get worked up on. I, I don't understand. I mean, I'm a very, very laid back kind of gal. So it's not the, the little idiosyncratic things that people allow to derail their day. It's, it's not important. It's not worth it. Like really try to look at the big picture and kind of go easy on yourself and give yourself grace all the time. Makes sense. Yeah. Sure. I really appreciate your story. It's yeah, too. It, it really well. I'm a fan. I appreciate guys. it for sure. Yeah. We thank you. Thank you. All right, Jeremy's trying to find the button. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Simon. We only, yeah, we only, does. we only hit it every week twice. <laughs> <laughs> We've been off. Hey too. guys, we appreciate you listening. Um, make sure you guys like and share all our content. If you got any questions, comments, or concerns, you can email us at fullgrilllife at gmail.com sorry so all right so if you want to follow us on social media see what's going on you can find us um at instagram and facebook at full gorilla life and on twitter at gorilla full with two l's so it's not like beautiful it's yeah i can't l's. use that one or i've been called out on that so it's not full. like yeah so. all right or you can visit our website at uh, full gorilla dot life as well as uh hit subscribe on your podcast app of choice later adios thank you